Shows. The following interview was conducted with Elaine Brower for the Purdue University Libraries. It takes place on February 2nd, 2016 over the phone. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. So hello, Elaine. Hi there. Uh, can you tell us when and where you were born and what life was like growing up? Uh, I was born in New Jersey, uh, in Arlington, New Jersey. <clears throat> and uh, I, I lived in uh, a couple of different towns throughout my uh, uh, growing up years. And uh, it was it was uh, during the time period of uh, World War II when I was most uh, aware of what was going on, and, and in uh, junior high and high school, and uh, involved in such things as Girl Scouts, stuff like that. At that time, we were living uh, in northern Jersey, just across the uh, George Washington Bridge from uh, Manhattan. Uh-huh. And uh, this, this was an area uh, that was uh, uh, what the, the civil defense was very concerned about. So we had uh, uh, blackout drills and things of that nature. And the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts were always involved in checking on that uh, and reporting to the civil defense people that, that people were using their blackout curtains and their lights could not be seen and that sort of thing. So uh, during that time period of World War II, uh, and of course uh, at one point the uh, uh, Germans uh, landed on Long Island from the German submarine and that caused quite a, a row at that point in time so it was uh, it, it was a di different time period than uh, anything else uh, uh, for the for the young people yeah it sounds like a really those the that you grew up in the war years but they were really intimate war years kind of not so much like they are today yeah totally different than today so what made you decide to go all the way to Purdue for school? Well, I uh, I had developed a love for aviation uh, during the, that uh, time period. Uh, we had family that lived in England and uh, uh, sent packages of food over to them as often as we could. And uh, I, I had concluded during high school, well, I, first of all, I was very fortunate in my high school that they held a uh, class on aeronautics for the high school students if you wanted it, and naturally I took it. So that uh, uh, kept or uh, developed my interest even more. Uh, then, of course, uh, with the war, uh, Canada was not too far north of us, and the Canadians, uh, Canadian RCAF was uh, flying in, in Europe with the British RAF, and uh, Canada had an RCAF, uh, I'll call it a woman's auxiliary, I'm not sure exactly what the name of it was. Uh -huh. But these women flew uh, planes, ferried planes from Canada to England for uh, for the use of the Canadian pilots over there. Hmm. And uh, I thought that would be a good thing to do. So I convinced my mother that I could I should go up to Canada and learn to fly and ferry planes to England. Well, that uh, there was one hitch on that. I had to. Uh, I had to finish high school, ah. and uh, uh, I, f I graduated high school in June of 45, and VE Day had happened in May of 45, so uh, from my perspective there was not a lot of uh, logic to going up to Canada, and yeah. it would be much better to, to go on with my education. Huh. And then as far as uh, you ask about how did I 
how did I select Purdue? Uh, at that point in time, Purdue was one of the top three, and I presume it still is, although I haven't followed this, but one of the top three uh, engineering schools in the country. And the other two were on the two coasts, and uh, I, California was just too far away uh -huh. from home uh, for me to even think about that. So I chose Purdue, huh. and I have been very, very happy that I chose that. Uh, we had talked to the, uh, a woman at my high school. Uh, it was, it, this was also kind of interesting. She taught my mother math, and uh, when my mother was in school, in high school, and when I was there at that school, high school, she was a, uh, a math teacher and a counselor. So uh, we talked to her from the counseling standpoint, and she said Purdue would be a very, very, very good choice. So uh, Were you I wound up applying to Purdue and was accepted, thankfully, and uh, have been very thankful for that education ever since. I'll bet. Were you tempted to go to MIT at all? Uh, <laughs> This is probably something I shouldn't publicize too much, but I have never liked MIT. Oh, okay. It's so interesting. Too close to home, huh? MIT and Caltech were the other two, and, and uh, MIT I just never liked. Huh. And uh, Caltech was just too far away. So Purdue I was... I had never been, been far away from, uh, from home uh, at that point in time. Uh -huh. uh, high school kids, well, high school kids around where I lived did not travel far without their parents. Yeah, I think high school kids in general back then probably didn't venture I too think far. That's true. Um, Life has changed considerably. Yeah. When you were in high school and you took that aviation class, were there other female students in the class with you, or were you one of the, the few? As I recall, I was the only one, but oh. I can't swear to that. Huh. And did that, uh, was that, did that present any challenges in high school, or or because it was just uh, an interest and a hobby of yours, was it just fine? It, it was, uh, it was just uh, because I was interested in it. I had been, I had made model planes for a number of years, uh, balsa wood planes. And uh, uh, as I say, was interested in aviation, and uh, uh, it, it, the course was there, and it seemed the most logical thing in the world for me to take it. And things just fell into place then. Yes. Um, so when you got to Purdue, how were those times? What was it like um, moving? Why well, I think it's a that's a pretty far distance to move. It, it, yeah. It's not California, but it. It's it's pretty out in the middle of the country. Um, yes, <laughs> I had not seen the middle of the country before that. Yeah, how, how was the acclimation process? Yeah, it was it was an interesting trip out there and all of that. Um, I I thought the uh, well, I stayed in the dorms. I was in. Uh, well, let me think. I was in North Hall the first year, I believe, and then, uh, oh golly, then South Hall the second year. And at that time, there was just the three women's uh, dorms that were uh, permanent dorms, North, South, and Wood. Uh huh. And uh, then, uh, then after that, uh, the uh, upperclassmen that were in in the dorms in WRH uh, were out in the in the uh, in temporary buildings, the uh, Chippewa and Bunker Hill, mm -hmm. and those buildings, of course, have been demolished long since. But uh, it it was interesting, and uh, the I had a lot of friends in the in the dorms and. Uh, couple of some of the uh, 
uh, what do they call them, counselors, I guess, on, on the dorm floors were very good, uh, very good people, very good counselors. A couple of them I kept up with for a number of years uh, uh, after graduation. And uh, I just enjoyed the people that I met there very much. And uh, by and large, most of them were from the uh, Midwest, I guess you'd say. Uh, it was uh, uh, mostly Indiana, Illinois, uh-huh. that, that area. And you, um, you were one of the few coastal people, I bet. Uh, yeah, there was one one uh, gal from Florida, I remember, uh, but aside from that, I don't remember people, or, or I'm talking about women in the dorms now, mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember any from any further than a, a couple of states. I, I'm sure there were some from Ohio. I can't pinpoint anybody there, but uh, uh, they were all right around in the end. Uh-huh. Did you interact with the Dean of Women at all during that time? I, I'm sorry, what was that? Did you interact with the Dean of Women at all at that time? I understand they had a, um, uh, a significant impact. Women, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, interact. Uh, it was right after the war, and yeah, that would have been Helen Schliemann. She was probably pretty new at the time as dean of women. Well, I I uh, I remember her in, in terms of uh, contacts. Uh, there there was also. Uh, uh, now this was not in in my uh, freshman or well I, I'm not sure what year it was it could have been sophomore or junior year but uh, Dr. Lillian Gilbreth was uh, on on the staff as a uh, uh, well not not a permanent constantly teaching professor but as a as a and I'm not sure what the words are here. It's like uh, a visiting, the, uh, a visiting one, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Right. She and was... uh, she was uh, when we tried to get started a uh, a women's group, a women's engineering group. Uh, it was called Pi Omicron. Uh huh. And uh, because everything was Greek at that time, we picked Greek letters. Uh huh. And uh, she was uh, a strong proponent of it, of course, and came and uh, 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 met with the board of directors and, uh, of, of the uh, university and uh, pushed for uh, allowing the start of that, that organization. I, I remember that. I, I think I must have been in my junior year, but I'm I'm just guessing on that. Mm -hmm. And what was it like? What 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 was she like to interact with? Oh, Dr. Gilbert. Uh huh. Oh, she's an absolutely marvelous person. Oh. Uh, because I uh, joined the Society of Women Engineers uh, after graduation, I uh, had contact with her. Well, let's see, I guess the last time I, I met Dr. Gilbreth was uh, at a meeting down in uh, Huntsville, Alabama in the late 60s. Wow. So, uh, yeah, she was a, a marvelous person to talk to, to uh, help on any anything you wanted uh, that, uh, you know, helped women engineers uh, by her, her support her her talking to groups or whatever uh -huh. and uh, of course she had uh, had that tremendous background uh, written up and well known and cheaper by the dozen uh -huh. book in the movie I think of all that at, way back in then those years mm -hmm. 
um, she must have, she must have been so proud of uh, the accomplishments that you had after Purdue. Well, I don't know on, on a personal basis that's kind of hard because she was involved in in so many women uh, graduating in engineering at that time. Well, I say so many. Numerically, they were few compared to anything since then. Mm -hmm. But compared to anything before that time, they were uh, a lot going through uh, as a result of World War II. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And um, and did she teach any of your classes? No, no. no. She's just more of a mentor figure around campus. That, that is correct. Okay. And um, how how are your classes at Purdue being kind of a minority um, amongst your classmates? I would imagine that the the classes were mostly males, right? Yeah, definitely mostly male. You were normally the only female in the class. Uh, by and large, the, I don't remember the... There were, there were some guys that were wondering why you were taking it, that sort of thing. But uh, I, on the whole, I don't remember any uh, anything with the guys. Of course, so many of the guys coming back were, were uh, coming back on the... Uh, GI uh, Bill, right? The uh, government bill, the uh, GI Bill. Uh-huh the education and they were they were older people than your normal high school uh college age person college kids yeah uh-huh you had a, quite a mixture of of uh, everything there huh. and a lot of the uh, guys coming back from the war of course were uh were working uh i i was working i worked in the kitchen for uh uh either as a waitress or in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, some of the guys work there, and uh, so you got to know them uh, away from class and more on a friend-to-friend friend friend basis. And uh, here again, most of them were, most of the ones that I knew uh, were really nice guys, and they'd been through a lot with the war, and... Uh, their their experiences were totally different, and their attitudes were totally different. Hmm. They they wanted to uh, get that college education and get on with their lives, and uh, uh, shall we say more concentrated on the future, mm -hmm. on their education and their future. Hmm. Interesting, and. Um and and what about your other classes? Did you did you have to take any um, home ec classes, or did anybody try to convince you to uh, stick with consumer and family sciences or any of that stuff? I don't remember any of that stuff. Well, I don't remember it at all. Great! I mean, they, you missed uh, out on some interesting things, I bet. Um, but uh, I they to say. Uh, uh, the first year was all all general engineering, so no matter what type of engineering you wanted to go into, the, your freshman classes were all the same. Uh huh. So you you did not, in my case, choose aeronautical engineering until the sophomore year, uh -huh. and the other people didn't choose mechanical or electrical or chemical or whatever. Uh huh. And of course. At that point in time, there were very uh, uh, a lot fewer quote engineering courses than there are today. With the advent of uh, computers and all of that sort of stuff, There's now if you've got bioengineering and all of these other types of engineering that didn't exist back in the forties. Uh, mm -hmm. You had mechanical, electrical, civil, chemical. Aeronautical was the newest thing uh, to come across the uh, uh, horizon there, and that was a break off of mechanical engineering. Ah, 
how um how is the caliber of the classes were they challenging or if you were you must have been pretty gifted in math and science so maybe they were just easy for definitely you definitely not chemistry oh <laughs> uh oh I had, I had some trouble with chemistry no don't we all <laughs> but, but uh, uh the, the classes were uh well, I, 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 yeah, they they were challenging, but uh, you didn't expect them to be easy. Uh huh. Exactly. Uh, Did you have any favorite classes? Oh golly. Uh, well, when I got to uh, to the, the strictly aeronautical classes, they were they were really good. Uh, at the time. Professor Braun was the uh, head of the aero department, and he taught a uh, structures class, and actually had written a book on it. Mm -hmm. uh, he he was very good, and uh, I I struggled a little with structures, but uh, uh, kinematics in the, the ME department. I remember that one. That was. Uh, that was not much of a problem, but I remember it because one of the other girls in the uh, in our uh, dorm was taking it at the same time that I was, and she had a different professor, and she was having a hell of a time hmm. <laughs> because her professor did not think women should be in oh, engineering, dear. and mine was just fine with it. Gosh. So we worked together on that. Uh, a fair amount mm -hmm. that term, hmm. but uh, uh, on the whole, I I, I didn't have uh, that much problem. I just was because uh, I I spent a lot of time over at the uh, at the athletic building and. Uh, That's right. You were really into sports as a student, right? Yes, yeah. Can you tell us more about that? Well, everything was intramural, uh, and we uh, we did go down to uh, uh, games with other schools in, my recollection is they were all in Indiana. Uh, I remember Ball State, we played various sports with. Obviously, in Indiana, basketball was one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, coming from the east, I was, uh, I liked field hockey, ah. and they had a field hockey team, and we did go uh, play other schools in that. I can't remember who we played. Uh, I remember going up to Chicago to uh, University of Chicago for some basketball games. Uh, but uh, uh, most of it was intramural. I played softball and uh, uh, they, they, the uh, dorms had teams, so some, some of the time you got recruited to a, a sport that you weren't particularly good at or interested in to fill out a team. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was tennis. Uh, oh. I, I had not played tennis before. But, huh. Doing uh, those sports must have um, given you a nice sense of camaraderie, though, with your oh yeah yeah with the other students. Yeah, and the dorms uh, the dorms were very very good that way, uh, and I think uh, uh, the the. The eating and and things like that. Well, dinners were all served at, in the dining room, mm -hmm. and uh, so you you were sitting at tables tables of either eight or ten mm -hmm. with others from your dorm, and you know you just through the dinner hour. Uh, if you were sitting at that table, you you got to converse with them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, a lot of the time I was waiting tables, so ah. I was not sitting at the tables, but mm. uh, uh, and by rules I could I was not supposed to converse with the people at that point in time. Huh. Still, you, you know, you're, you're af after the uh, at other times during the halls, uh, during a, while you're in the dorm and in the rec room and various places like that. Uh, by and large, I, I had a, a very good time and uh, enjoyed the, uh, most of the people, uh, uh, most of the students and, uh, and the staff was, uh, I, th I thought the staff was good. So it, it was a very good time. It sounds like a good experience. And uh, then what happened when you graduated? Uh, I, I went uh, back to the uh, to where my parents lived, and uh, it was uh, it was a hard time to get a job. I was uh, I did not get a job right away, but uh, uh, right graduated in June, and I wound up. Uh, 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 bit monitoring a, a playground in, in the town I lived mm. in, or my parents lived in, for the summer to to have a job to do something. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I was able to get a job down at the uh, Naval Air Development Center uh, north of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, since I didn't have a car and did, my father drove me down for the interviews and stuff like that. Oh gosh! And uh, I was uh, I was very interested in uh, they uh, someplace along the line. I do not remember at all where or who. But as I interviewed, starting at the at kind of at the bottom of their ranking of of uh, supervisors and managers. Uh, somebody indicated that the last person I would see would be a, a, a chap that was a Purdue graduate, hmm. and uh, I have uh, that that was what happened. And I have always figured that since it was a tough time to get jobs, and I was just a, out of school and nothing special and all that. Uh, I have always figured that he had a, a uh, had okayed or said pushed to get me on board. I had always credited him with uh, the fact that I got that job. Ah, because of that Purdue connection, huh? That's correct. Huh. And how did the trip? So I have jot jotted down here that you worked on aerodynamic design and flight path evaluations. How did they ever train you for that kind of stuff? Oh, it's the, the job training there uh, is, is all on the job training, but uh, you know, you've got the basics from school. And, and of course, at that point in time too, uh, all the, all the computations were done by uh, uh, desk calculators, Marchand Frieden calculators. There weren't computers, mm -hmm. so you're you're sitting there with with calculators on your desk and and doing these calculations by hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just uh, working with the formulas that you've got which are parceled out in in you know a format on the, on the paper so that you could just calculate step by step going across and uh, uh, do the calculations by punching the computer uh, calculator and uh, of course things have changed dramatically yeah but it sounds like Purdue prepared you well Oh, they definitely, definitely did, definitely. You know, Purdue is a great school. 
And then you decided to go to grad school eventually, right? Uh, yes, after, uh, well, from that first job in, in typical go government fashion, there was a, a reduction in force. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, went, uh, I was able to get a uh, job. Uh, the job at the uh, first job was at the Naval Air Development Center, so it was Navy Department. Uh -huh. I went down to D.C. and... Uh, with another job in the Navy Department at the David Taylor Model Base and uh, uh, wind tunnel testing on airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after that, uh, I had decided that I wanted to get my uh, master's and uh, uh, went to Michigan for that. And uh, that, that worked out uh, very well. What, what, was there anything in particular that does that made you want to um, get your master's? Uh, I can't remember anything other than the, the feeling that things were changing and that by that time I'd been out working about, uh, oh, what, four years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, had been able to save uh, save enough money to uh, think about that, so uh, it it just seemed that that was the uh, best thing that I could do at that point in time. So, and nuclear engineering was just coming into play, and the uh, nuclear industry, and and it. it didn't really know where all that was going to go, but you you hoped that it would be something that uh, uh, would meld well with the aviation side. As it happened, I uh, stayed in aviation for uh, without the without any nuclear stuff for uh, for a number of years, but uh, then eventually. Uh, the nuclear degree helped me uh, in my later years. Uh huh. So uh, oh, was that well, that must have been a drastic switch from aeronautical to nuclear, right? Was that that was yeah. And uh, Michigan and st uh, was was a good school to go to for that. There was there were very few schools that uh, had nuclear engineering and. Here again, it was it was uh, well, kind of like uh, aeronautical at like Purdue back in the forties. Uh, nuclear was just getting started, and at uh, in the in the colleges, and Michigan uh, was one of several that had developed a nuclear program. And uh, I remember Henry Gomberg was the uh, chairman of the department. He was very good, and it, the whole thing was good uh, there at uh, Michigan. And uh, I was able to uh, get a job at the Engineering Research Institute at Michigan, and so I was working uh, as well as going to school. And that that was pretty much a necessity, and they um, they. Uh, had to have needed help there too because uh, <clears throat> they they uh, someplace through the uh, registration uh, cycle there uh, they asked me if I wanted a, to uh, a job while I was uh, going to school and I said yeah hmm. you bet <laughs> mm -hmm. and. Uh, so they sent me over to Engineering Research Institute there, and, and that, again, a very nice bunch of people there uh, at, at all levels, and uh, I enjoyed that. That's wonderful. Um, so um, was the... Was the environment of the grad school days, was that um, kind of similar to your time as an undergrad as far as equality f for women and the opportunities? 
Hmm. Well, it uh, yeah, because again, there weren't weren't many women, uh, and it. I can't. Uh, I can't remember whether there was any other woman in the uh, in the nuclear grad school courses. I would imagine that back then it was there was probably not an, a lot of women in engineering as undergrads but even fewer in grad school but maybe if you um if you were able to get into grad school I, you must have had the admiration of a lot of people because that was pretty groundbreaking that back then I bet well, I don't remember any difficulty. Uh, in fact, uh, I ha I guess I had uh, applied to Michigan for grad school in the aeronautics department, uh, and not taken that up uh, initially, and then a couple of years later uh, applied for nuclear, and was startled to find the, the fact that I had applied in, in aeronautics since it was engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had been accepted there. Uh, they didn't uh, have to go through anything with me. I had, I had already been accepted in ah. grad school two years before I, uh, I started with nuclear engineering. Huh. So, uh, uh, and did, did your class, do you, now this is like digging way back in the past, but did your classmates have the same industry experience that you did? There was a great variety of, of experience there and a great variety of age of the people. Hmm. Uh, and the, the fact that I will had said I wanted to work at the uh, engine or and they got me a job at the Engineering Research Institute. Uh, the The program I was working on was headed up by a chemistry uh, professor and uh, a a uh, chap that was working in the nuclear department for his PhD was running a specific program and I was going to be working directly for him and he was also from New Jersey and uh, uh, so we wound up having a lot of commonalities uh, and you know you develop this friendship along the line and he was he was uh, had a family out there he moved his family out there he had uh, a couple of kids and and uh, so I, I got to meet his wife and his kids and spend some time with them. And, you know, it's more than just the schoolwork or the job or whatever. It was uh, it was a, a better, a, a, well, a nicer, uh, a nicer environment mm -hmm. in that respect. Okay. So it, it was... Uh, it was all very good, and, and I was very thankful. I, thinking back on it, the fact that I did want to work while going to school for my master's uh, turned out to be a very big positive in my mind. Huh, I didn't realize that. So did you work full-time while you were getting your master's? Uh, I, no, I wasn't... Uh, it wasn't full time. It was probably three quarters time or something. I, uh, was it for the university? What was that? Did you work for the university? No. It, well, it was for the Engineering Research Institute, and your checks came from there. Now, they got contracts from various places. Uh, they had contracts from, because of the nuclear side, from uh, companies that were building or operating nuclear power plants. Uh, mm -hmm. the Detroit Edison, I remember, was one. Mm -hmm. 
had uh, contracts from the federal government uh, for the evaluation of, of uh, proposals for the nuclear-powered merchant ship. We went to Washington one, uh, one spring break to work on the evaluation of, the, uh, of these contracts, uh, proposals hmm. for the nuclear-powered merchant ship. And uh, uh, there were, there, you know, we, I can't remember all of the types of, all of the people or companies that we had contracts with, but the Engineering Research Institute had contracts directly with these various organizations, companies, government, whatever, mm-hmm. and, and our checks, uh, our paychecks were paid by the Engineering Research Institute, okay. not the university, gotcha. but it was a part of the university. Uh huh. Um, well, it's nice to have that practical experience while you're getting the education too. Yes. Oh, the the fact that you were working on things nuclear at the same time you were studying them made all the difference in the world. I'll bet. And then, so once you finished your master's degree, um, how was the job market after that? Uh, well, I, uh, I chose to stay out at Michigan for an extra year, primarily because my sister had started at Purdue, and I wanted to be uh, a little bit closer to her because mom was and dad, daddy was still back on the East Coast. Uh-huh. And I remembered, you know, how, how I had felt. Mm-hmm. So I, I stayed uh, in Ann Arbor for an extra year. Oh, that's nice. And uh, uh, after that, if, uh, I went to Boston with AFCO Research. And uh, as I mentioned before, I was really back into the uh, aviation or aeronautical engineering side of things hmm. uh, because uh, that's what was that's where the jobs were uh-huh <laughs> was just nuclear just still new just too new at the time yeah hmm. um and then you eventually made your way to huntsville yeah uh right uh, how was that, Huntsville in the 1960s? It, it, was, uh, it was very good in, in some respects. Uh, it, the, uh, the Von Braun people had uh, a big influence on uh, Huntsville. Uh, they, uh, Von Braun was brought over from Germany uh, after World War II, uh-huh. and uh, to work on, he, he would have been uh, the instigator of the V-2 uh, rockets in Germany during World War II, and that, uh, after the war was over, he and his team were brought over t- uh, to the United States, and for, specifically for uh, the uh, development of rockets and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, they they had the Germans had a, a, a big influence on Huntsville, uh, and which was uh, in some respects very good because you, you the German German style things were in the stores and German uh, food was in. Uh, in some of the uh, cafe shops and that sort of thing. You, you could get kind of a German uh, lunch if you wanted. Wow. And uh, it, it was very interesting. Huh. And, uh, uh, Did you work with Von Braun closely? No, not at all. Okay. So you didn't, have, you didn't really have to interact with him too much? No. No, I, I was working... Strictly for Boeing. Boeing worked for NASA 
uh, and uh, it, it was uh, they they were our contact. Uh huh. And so uh, it, it, that was where where it was. And that must have been um, right around those years of the space race. Yeah, it was at the time that uh, Kennedy had said uh, we want to put a man on the moon and get him safely back to Earth in, in this decade. Uh huh. And uh, that's that's uh, when we uh, we were shooting for getting him up and back and by '69, and of course uh, the various things that went on in the process of doing that and uh, the unfortunate and part of, of losing two uh, two Purdue grads in, in Apollo 1 mm -hmm. uh, Gus Grissom and, and uh, Roger White uh, to the uh, fire on the pad mm -hmm. and uh uh, then the, that the recovery from that took uh, a good year, I think. I really forgotten how long, but it seemed like it was certainly a year, or maybe even more. I don't know. Hmm. But uh, were you? What was like a typical day like? Was it just like a lot of grind and 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 like a competitive environment, or was the whole the, the town of Huntsville just like a lot of? Uh, Rocket scientist types? <laughs> That's what everybody said. Huh. <laughs> he said, I'm so Alabama, and all, all the people anyplace else said, oh, that's the rocket science wow. area. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, it, it was, uh, to me, just like any other job. You go to work and you do your job. Uh-huh. The uh, the thing that we were doing in Bunsville, Huntsville uh, in Boeing Huntsville was the what was called the SE and IS contract, which was an integration contract. Hmm. The the uh, rocket the Saturn V rocket booster is three sta uh, four, yeah three stages. Uh, the first stage, the S-1C, was built by Boeing in New Orleans, which might just as well have been a totally different company, because hmm. Boeing New Orleans and Boeing Huntsville just were working as separate companies. Hmm. Uh, the S-2 stage, or the second stage, the S-2, was uh, built by North American out on Cal in California, and the third stage, the S-4B stage, was built by Douglas out in California. Hmm. And uh, we had to work closely with those companies. Now, when I say we, I'm saying Boeing Huntsville, and hmm. the we in the terms of the part of Boeing Huntsville depended upon what you were doing in Boeing Huntsville. Hmm. And uh, I, I was, doing the S-4B stage, the third stage. So I was, my group was working with uh, Douglas out in uh, Fountain Valley, California. Hmm. And uh, so you were, you were uh, constantly transmitting data back and forth, mostly from there, from there to Boeing because uh, the, uh, the, the data had to go from a nominal data, which was before the stage was built, to uh, through the building stage as they tested various elements, they to be able to modify the numbers that the uh, that a specific stage for a specific launch vehicle would have and we could crank in those specific numbers for the uh, for the particular flight. Then that got mesh, uh, meshed up with the uh, flight mechanics people f 
for that particular flight. So you integrated the, the flight details, the flight and the, and the uh, details of the equipment that was going to set, boost that flight into the air or into, the, into space. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as, and, when, and it went step by step over a period of a year. So you got more information, and you you did more calculations, and uh, uh, found that what what would work and what wouldn't work, and and various and sundry things, and uh, uh, it it all went uh, in- integrated because Huntsville had the uh, uh, had the uh, flight mechanics. And the, uh, that was a group uh, on the same floor that I was on, just down the hall a ways. Hmm. And uh, they had the ele- electrical people, the electronics people, and they were in the same building, but a, a different floor or uh-huh. something like that. Hmm. And uh, it, it all got integrated there. So you were working with different parts of Boeing Huntsville as well as different companies that were building the stages. Uh Uh-huh. When you mentioned that you're constantly transmitting data back and forth to, say, the group in California, how did did you transmit data back then? Uh, Not as easily as today. I bet not. But, uh, I think it, it, uh, you know what, I'm having a hard time remembering that. You know, we might, there's a flight archivist on staff here, and she's, she's a whole bunch more familiar with this space stuff than I am, so I'm wondering, she might, she might want to do a follow-up interview with you on some of these specific things, because a lot of it's, um... Well, foreign territory for me. <laughs> okay. But, um, so when you were doing all this cool cutting edge work in the 60s, when you went home at the end of the day, what did you do for fun? Oh, that's, uh, that's when I bought my uh, airplane. Oh, that's right. You, uh, you flew. You uh, get off the ground and forget what's on the ground oh. and just enjoy the uh, the scenery, the the flying, the everything. So yeah, I I had actually started when I was at Purdue learning to fly. There was a a club a uh, a club there that I joined for flying and and. Uh, someplace along the line uh-huh uh somebody wrecked the plane so that Ooh. was the end of that oh no yeah and when i was down in uh in dc at the david taylor model basin uh a bunch of us got together from the uh, aero lab and bought a a taylor craft plane uh that had been wrecked up in pennsylvania one of the guys towed it down to uh, to uh, D.C. Uh huh. Was a uh, A and E, uh, uh, so he could sign off the uh, the modifications, the uh, the improvements, the uh, uh, reconstruction of this wreck, and we all worked on the wreck and uh, and. Here was one one place I I I got stuck with a job because I was a woman and I couldn't fight it. Oh. Uh, and it had nothing to do with our my work my work of uh, com- as companies or anything like that. But uh-huh. uh, being the only woman in the group that bought this airplane and the uh, Taylor Craft is a fabric covered plane. I got to sew the fabric of the wings, and uh, that is one H of a job. Oh, gosh, I can't imagine. <laughs> I, I found that the FAA has very specific 
seams that you sew this fabric uh, uh, together on, and I forget how many pieces of, of fabric have to be sewed for the wings on, on a uh, Taylor craft, but it, I think it was more than four. Huh. And, uh, the, and a, a strip has to cover it, uh, both sides uh, of the plane uh, of the wing. Uh, it's from the from the uh, uh, trailing edge up over the uh, front uh, over, over the top of the wing around the leading edge and down to the uh, uh, back to the trailing edge underneath there too so it's long mm -hmm. why was the why was the plain fabric covered Say that again. Why was the plain fabric covered? Well, back in the old days, old, old days, all planes were fabric covered. Is that right? I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, but what? why? So this, the finish wouldn't get scratched, or was it an aerodynamics thing? That was before they had uh, made metal planes. Oh, Wow. The only metal in the very early planes was the structural supports. Uh-huh. Huh. So what were they made out of? Do you know? What was what made out of? The planes. If um if they if if only the structural part was metal, then well, the rest was before wasn't... the metal too, uh, you know, going way back, it was all wood. Oh, Go I back can't... to the uh uh Right there at this, and, and it's the the structure is wood. Wow, I can't imagine, huh? I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um. And so when you when you had this shared plane with the group, did you just take turns? Um, you know, flying it on the weekends, or how did that work? Uh, you, you had to sign up and take your shot at at uh, getting the time you wanted. Okay. Yeah, Where it was a, a group owned. I see. Uh, and uh, where did you? Where did so you f flew? Wh where did you fly around there? Did you use a specific airport? Uh, yeah, we flew out of uh, a small airport north, uh, up in up in the Bethesda, Maryland area. I've, I've even forgotten what airport that was. Huh. Well, that sounds like a fun hobby. But uh, yeah. That, but then, uh, by the time I was in Huntsville, uh, I I was flying out of uh, an a, an airport in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Hmm. Huntsville is very close to the Tennessee border. Okay. So the uh, the Huntsville airport is a commercial airport, and uh, the Fayetteville airport is what they call general aviation mm -hmm. so it's it's uh, easier f as far as taking lessons and doing your training and flying small aircraft you you don't have to deal with a tower all the time and uh, this sort of thing hmm. um and you got involved with the 99s as well too right yes Yes, that happened uh, when I was in Huntsville, too. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the 99s as a group? and and? Um... Well, it's, it's a, a group that was started uh, way back uh, uh, by, uh, by, well, 99 women. That's where the name came from. Uh-huh. And... Uh, uh, is it? I think I'd have to check this. I think I think Amelia Earhart was the first president of it. I I'm believe not so sure. too. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. But uh, there were a lot of uh, women pilots back then, uh, and uh, a, a lot of women flew back then that are not really recognized today, but uh, 
they started this organization and uh, it has uh, grown uh, a part of the changing dynamics of our society as a whole now that women are more involved in all sorts of things in aviation and the 99s is women pilots mm -hmm. uh, there are m women mechanics there are women ah. uh, in, in uh, all, all sorts of jobs in the aviation industry uh -huh. Uh, there's a, a, a new organization, I say new, probably three, three four years old, mm -hmm. called Women in Aviation. Uh -huh. And uh, there's a lot of women that are in, in these other jobs uh, associated with aviation uh, join that organization. So there's, uh, uh, like in so many things, the number of women involved in in something new, new being in the last 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, an organization sprouts up to, uh, to bring them together, to uh, uh, give them cross-identity with, with other people uh, in that general area and that sort of thing so it's all part of the what's changing in in the world mm -hmm. and how did you get involved with the 99s uh there were some other people in Bo boeing huntsville that belonged and uh i guess you say they were recruiting uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, uh I joined it, and it was a it was a very good group down there in the southeast. Uh, uh, some of the uh, women were pilots. They were pilots, but they were pilots. They got into it because their husbands uh, ran companies associated with aviation with, uh -huh. with aircraft. One of the women I remember, uh, her husband at that point in time had taken over the company that his father had built uh, that dealt with planes. Uh, rebuilding, uh, rebuilding, uh, repairing, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, these people had a, uh, at a ranch north of Huntsville where we had picnics and they had to get a grass strip there, so it was fun, fun to fly in on, on the grass strip. Oh, my. And, uh, because the, the, uh, change had already been started to, to put in more uh, pavement strips for general aviation and more small fields, whereas years and years and years ago, everybody flew into the grass strips. Uh huh. And uh, it, the the experience of flying into a grass strip is something that's very beneficial at times. Ah, yeah, there was that story about you landing in the trees once. Uh, that, that, was, uh, that was one of my instructors, and one of the things that I've always been very thankful for, for the, was the two instructors that I had, one in New Orleans and one in, in uh, well, while I was in Huntsville, he was based in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Uh, were both ex-army, retired army pilots and army instructors. And they, uh, they put you through the mill and they wanted to prepare you for anything that could happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one chap, his name was Lucky. He's, he, one night when we were up flying, uh, night flying, 
he said, uh, what are you going to do if the engine goes out now? And at that point, I hadn't been thinking about an engine out at night. Hmm. So uh, he, he started me thinking about landing in a tree Oof. because there, that area that we were in, there were a lot of trees and not a lot of open space to hmm. get down on the ground. Mm -hmm. And the objective is to get down on the ground safely. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, get down on the ground safely for you as a person, not so much the airplane. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, you can always climb down a tree, but uh, you, you might not... Uh, be able to walk away from a crash on the on the ground. Uh huh. Makes sense. So, uh, uh, you know, things like that you remember forever. Ooh. So you never actually experienced landing in the trees. No, so. I did not. Oh gosh. <laughs> just practice. Oh dear. Did you? Did he make you climb trees just in case? No, no. <laughs> just, uh, get close to the tree. Ha! Huh. How interesting. I never would have thought of that. Uh, I had never thought about it, and I would imagine that very few instructors ever thought about anything like that. But, but uh, when... I have always been very thankful that I had uh, ex-Army instructors because they thought about things like that. And as I look at instructors in this day and age, I am surprised at what they don't teach. Ah, interesting. It, uh, yeah, hmm. it, it's a different uh, time frame. That's interesting. Um, what about that flight that you took from um, um, Huntsville to Seattle? That was a long flight, right? Yeah, it took a few, <laughs> a few tries to get the plane out here. <laughs> yeah, I... I, uh, well, I had to go, I, I went back, I was working at Boeing, uh, Seattle at the time. I had moved, and the plane was still back in Huntsville. And I went back to get it over a Labor Day, Labor Day? Yeah, Labor Day weekend, thinking I could, I could make it if everything, if weather held together. Uh -huh. uh, weather, of course, did not hold together. Uh-huh. And uh, I went by Memphis and Tulsa, uh, got out of Tulsa okay, went up uh, through Nebraska and, and uh, I was Getting over into Wyoming, and uh, I went to Sheridan, Wyoming, to get fuel. Uh huh. And then uh, the weather was beginning to close in, and I was going to go. Uh, I, I went north out of there. And the weather was closing in, so I, I decided I was going to fly the highways. Uh, it's it's pretty barren out there. Uh huh. Go cross country. Uh huh. So I flew north and got to. Uh, gosh, I've forgotten. So you fly the highways because if something happens, there's people around. Right? Well, and there's a place to land. Oh, okay. And you're not stuck out in the middle of nowhere. Uh huh. It's in the Black Rock Desert out there. Uh, Wyoming, Montana. I mean, th those states are pretty barren. Mm hmm. Out away from people. Gotcha. And so I went up and uh, I got up uh, uh, north there someplace, and I remember. And it was at the intersection of two interstate highways. I'd gone north, and I, and I hit the one going east and west. And I was debating whether I could get into Billings. 
and work in the radio to find the forecasts and all of that. Uh huh. And uh, so I was circling this intersection of the uh, interstates while I did this. Uh huh. I finally decided I could go on. I would try to get into Billings. Uh huh. And I I did make it fortunately, uh, but I was coming in uh, that that airport is. Coming in from the east is uh, higher than the uh, basic ground level. So you, uh, I was coming in flying low. Uh -huh. I had to climb for to get to the uh, airport level, to the runway level, huh. and uh, got in there fortunately. And uh, then the weather shut down. Wow. What and, year was that? Uh, the, the objective of getting into there, uh, I either had to get into Billings or had to go back to Sheridan because that was the only two places I could get a, a commercial plane out of to Seattle hmm. to get back to work the next day. Ooh, so, wow. uh, I, I made it to Billings. I got back to, uh, I got a flight back to uh, Seattle hmm. and uh, got to work. So, uh, then I, I went back to uh, get the plane some other weekend and uh, got out of Billings okay and was flying across Montana and there were pretty good headwinds uh, at that point in time and uh, it was not making too good of time. Hmm. And the uh, I I was gonna again because of where I could get commercial flights from, I had to get to Spokane. So I realized I was not going to uh, be getting to Spokane, but that the weather was such that I had to get on the ground, hmm. and uh, I wound up these these mountains out here uh, and I was not familiar with mountain flying at the time which was a a, a bad thing huh. uh, I was one valley over uh, from where I should should have been to get into Spokane but I saw a, a break in the clouds and I, I could get down to uh, see where I was and I got down and saw a, a small strip with planes on it and huh. thought it was thought it was one airfield and then found out that I was one valley over from where I thought I was oh. and uh, anyway I landed and uh, shortly thereafter <laughs> The uh, FBO from the uh, other field that I thought I was into or going into came over and said the uh, that the FAA wanted me to close my flight plan. And oh dear! Explained, explained that uh, I was one valley short of where I thought I was. Oh. And uh, anyway, I. I had to leave the plane there for a few more weeks. Oh, no. Yeah, and then uh, there was a, uh, a guy uh, working in a uh, uh, group in Boeing, uh, Seattle, that uh, was located close near where I was working. And he, he flew. He had a plane in one of the Seattle airports, air, Seattle area airports, and he volunteered to fly me over to get it on a weekend when the uh, when the weather was good, uh -huh. which was just absolutely tremendous because I was trying to figure out how I'd get back to get it. Uh huh. And uh, he uh, he flew me over. Uh, we got. He gave his wife a ride. <laughs> uh, Let's see. And 
he had some other chap with him who flew his plane. So it was a, a group of three planes, three planes going back. Huh. And uh, it's very good. Yeah, that's what friends are for, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the great things about the aviation, uh, the general aviation uh, area. Everybody is friends with everybody else. Huh. And if you got a problem, you got help. Oh. Well, that's that's wonderful. I was going to ask also about the Society of Women Engineers and how that organization was um, for you support-wise or how it, it helped you professionally. Uh, SRI is uh, a very good. Uh, it's, it has grown tremendously uh, since the old days. Uh, back in the 60s when I was an officer, uh, we had about 8,000 people, and that included students. Uh, now we're, we're up in, I think, are in the 50, 60,000 range. Uh-huh. Uh, it's it's uh, very good from many aspects. At that point in time, in the old days, it was good for just uh, uh, discussing situations in different companies mm -hmm. and learning things about companies that are good and, com and things that are bad about companies. Uh huh. Help you to make decisions or, uh, with some background knowledge. Interesting. Uh, it. Uh, the the, the uh, contact with the people and has has always been very good. Of course, I'm I'm not doing anything with it now. I'm I just go to a few meetings a year out here, <clears throat> but uh, some of that is interesting because uh, our January meeting was a meeting called the way we are, and they have this every January and. Uh, it, the object is that two of our, our members talk about their jobs and what they are doing and how they like it and their life uh, life experiences meshed with the job and things of that nature. Uh huh. But, uh, it's an I guess you say almost an educational thing for for new people and a, a way to communicate with old people. Yeah, it sounds like a nice kind of networking um, yeah. consortium. Yeah. That insider information that you probably couldn't get any any other way. And it's nice that it has that female take on things, too. Yeah. And uh, the uh, uh, over the years, uh, SWE has worked with similar organizations in different companies countries, uh, and a, a group called ICWIS uh, has a, uh, well, it used to have international meetings every four years, international conferences every four years, which is, again, uh, discusses the same sort of things and, and has presentations from people of different countries. Hmm. Uh, I have only been to a, a meeting some years ago in uh, Britain. Uh, I know people that have been to Japan and uh, I got Austria, I think. Hmm. Uh, I, I can't remember all of the ones, but they've done. They've gotten together on an international basis. This was oh, gosh. 20, 25 years ago anyway, maybe more. Uh, well, it was 20 years ago that I went to Britain, so it was more than that, hmm. 30 or 40 years ago, uh, that they got together and formed this ICWIS uh, organization. And uh, again, I think it's a, a good thing. It's, it's interesting and uh, it's beneficial in, in some respects to people. Mm-hmm. 
Well, good. Well, that's all the questions I have. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Uh, I, I think you've pretty much covered everything. Okay. Well, thanks for, for taking the time to share some of your memories with us. Well, you're welcome very much. My, my pleasure. Okay. I'm going to turn the recorder off now. Okay.